Good morning and welcome to our symposium today with the wonderfully positive title, The Art of Being Healthy and Well. We have an audience here with us in the Royal College of Physicians and of course we have uh, a remote audience as well, so you're all very welcome. We're going to be exploring how creativity makes and keeps us well, so why not start with music, one of the most powerful of the arts. Gerald Peregrine on the cello, Anthony Kearns, tenor, and Vincent Lynch on the keyboard performed in residential care settings across the country throughout the pandemic in the COVID Care Concerts series. And so far they've performed over 1,100 live concerts in nursing homes and hospitals and mental health settings in 21 counties. Uh, with over a hundred artists. Wonderful work. So right now for us, they're going to perform O Sole Mio. And if your heart didn't swell during that performance, I suggest you probably haven't got a heart. That was lovely, thank you guys. Um, and to open the symposium formally this morning, we're joined by Catherine Martin, the Minister for Tourism, Culture, Arts, Gaelfacht, Sport and Media. Would you welcome Minister Martin?
thank you, and Vincent, Gerald, and Anthony. That was extraordinarily beautiful and, and truly uplifting. And, and it does show um, in just what you've done there, the power of music, the power of the arts to, to what I believe can be to heal, to uplift, um, and everything that we will be discussing today. So thank you so much, and thank you for the extraordinary work you've done through, through the toughest and, um, times for, for, for our most vulnerable, and I appreciate that. A carja agus a coglaca illig, ta lukorum a vetina and bula live erin laher egon imoch sha. Kega will she tabtuk a lanamij erin a vet kermuk, is thoi lum gur vrahamar uin goler on chagbal goena. As well as the guests present here in person in such lovely surroundings as the Royal College of Physicians, I also welcome those of you attending online. Next Monday will mark two years since I was appointed minister. One of my first public engagements as minister was to open an event organised by the Creative Ireland Programme, Healthy Ireland and the HSE. That webinar in July 2020 explored the positive effect of creativity on well-being in older people. At the event, I also announced a Creativity in Older Age scheme, providing funding for a range of creative initiatives to support older people as they socially isolated and cocooned. COVID Care Concerts, established by Gerald Peregrine, was one such project. After having the pleasure to listen to such a powerful performance by Gerald, Anthony and Vincent, I think most people will understand clearly the benefits of arts and what it can bring to our well-being. This is why I have allocated over 4 million euros since 2020 to support people's well-being through arts, culture and creativity. Of course, there is a long and rich history of collaboration between the arts and healthcare sectors. The work of the Arts Council, HSE, local authorities, or arts organisations and individual artists has seen wonderful arts programming delivered into healthcare and community settings for some time now. This has largely been due to the commitment and vision of dedicated individual practitioners and champions at local or regional level. Today, as we take stock, and reflect on the future through this national symposium, I believe it is important that I acknowledge the important value of this work and these individuals from the arts and healthcare sectors. Their efforts demonstrate to us what is possible and illuminate the benefits that can flow from non-clinical interventions for health and well-being. Coming from a landscape, dotted as it is with islands of excellence from an arts and health perspective, it would seem important for the sectors to develop a shared vision and sense of common purpose. My officials in the Creative Ireland programme, together with their colleagues from Healthy Ireland and the Department of Health, the Health Service Executive and the Arts Council, have been examining this area closely. Some key messages have emerged from this work. We know there is a significant evidence base that demonstrates how arts interventions can help improve health and well-being and contribute to the prevention of a variety of mental and physical illnesses across the life course. Because the World Health Organization, as well as citizens, service users and their carers in Ireland tell us this. We know arts interventions are often low risk, highly cost effective, holistic treatment options for complex health challenges and therefore make business sense. Because along with the World Health Organization, respected medical consultants and researchers in the Irish health system report this. We know internationally that other countries are becoming better organized and are repositioning their public systems to mainstream this approach. And I welcome the director of the National Centre for Creative Health in the UK, who you will hear more from shortly. However, we must be realistic too about the challenges. Change is a process. For my part, I am committed to supporting this collaborative process between departments and agencies in the years ahead. 
In order to ensure sufficient focus is maintained on this important area of work, government decided in February to extend the Creative Ireland programme for the period 2023 to 2027 and to have creative health and wellbeing as one of the five priority areas of activity. This should provide the space where officials can continue to engage with each other and with the sectors to advance this intersectoral work. I wish to use this opportunity to welcome the positive manner in which the Department of Health and HSC have continued their engagement with my officials in the midst of some exceptionally challenging circumstances for them over the past two years. It has become apparent through this engagement that more practical support is required to enable the national coordination of arts and health within our health services. I am pleased, therefore, that through the Creative Ireland programme, my department will provide pilot funding to embed such a full-time position within the HSE centrally as they work collaboratively towards a more integrated delivery model. Clearly, there are real differences between the sectors that must be bridged. Differences in culture, differences in language, in priorities. Organisations like the Institute of Public Health have outlined the challenges of an arts sector that is focused on benefits arising from engagement processes, interfacing with a healthcare sector that relies upon evaluation of clinical outcomes to inform and underpin further investment. For that reason, in parallel with funding creative arts initiatives, I continue to invest in developing the evidence base regarding the association between and the long-term benefits of creative participation and health and well-being, such as through the TILDA programme at Trinity College. To date, this investment in research has highlighted the positive associations this participation has with reduced loneliness and better mental health. I am equally aware through the extensive consultations currently underway for the new Creative Youth Plan that the well-being of children and young people, particularly their mental well-being, is a particular area of concern. Minister O'Gorman and I continue to invest in partnerships with organisations such as Fighting Words and Youth Theatre Ireland to support community-based creative writing and youth theatre. <coughs> Minister Foley and I provide funding for local creative youth partnerships in out-of-school settings through the education and training boards. Collectively, these initiatives offer the most disadvantaged and seldom heard young people opportunities to support their mental well-being through creative pursuits. Before I conclude, I would like to pause for a moment to reflect on one other point. Through the All of Government Creative Ireland programme and Healthy Ireland, we are fortunate to have an extensive nationwide human infrastructure tasked with supporting the well-being of Irish people. Alongside the HSE's regional structures, we must make every effort to connect these networks, to enable and activate the added value that can arise through integrated approaches in areas of common endeavour. To that end, I will provide specific pilot funding this year for a number of local authority culture and creativity teams in healthy community locations to collaborate with social prescribers. This will enable referrals from the existing social prescribing infrastructure to connect to creative arts initiatives locally. I will be interested to see whether encouraging these networks to collaborate locally can add value to our respective well-being ambitions. So to conclude, the World Health Organization reported in 2020 that the positive potential impact arts interventions can have on the health and well-being of individuals and communities is not being fully realised because opportunities for collaborations between the arts and health sectors are not being properly developed. I believe we have reached a point of inflection in our endeavours on an individual sectoral basis. Through your attendance, Minister Donnelly and I have brought together expertise from public policy, the arts, the culture and creative sectors, healthcare and social care. I invite you to give us your best thinking 
on how Ireland can properly develop further opportunities for more sustainable collaboration between the sectors. This is truly important work, now more than ever, and I thank you for your input into it. Gurv Mila Mahagav. And our thanks to Minister Catherine Martin for taking the time to be with us today. But we're going to move on now. We're going to start by looking at the evidence, nationally and internationally, that creativity really does help to make us more healthy and to keep us more healthy. And to do that, we're joined by Alexandra Coulter, the director of the National Centre for Creative Health in the UK, Tom James, uh, who is the head of Healthy Ireland in the Department of Health, and you're an advertisement for it, Tom, may I say, a healthy looking man, um, and Tanya Bonotti, <laughs> who is the director of the Creative Ireland programme. Alexandra, it's, it's, it's so attractive to think that the arts could actually make us healthy as well, but I mean, what's um, the evidence? You've been on the UK all party parliamentary group on arts, health and well-being. So what's the evidence in the UK and internationally? Well, there is, as the, the minister referred to, a very substantial and growing evidence base, uh, both in the UK. A lot of it is coming from Northern Europe, the USA, Australia, New Zealand. The Nordic countries have a very strong um, role in this, and there's a new journal that's recently come out uh, on arts and health. But uh, that's not to say this work isn't happening across the globe, and um, that's partly to do with how it's defined. I think one of the interesting things is, is what's the scope of this territory and how broad do we go in terms of our understanding. If you think about it from the, the, the point of view of prevention, promotion, management of illness, treatment, recovery, end of life, uh, and through the life course and across the art forms, it's a, a massive area of work. Um, I think, though, it's, it's a moment where we need to start moving from uh, being focused on proving the benefits to improving the way that we integrate this work and this notion of collaboration and partnership across sectors. So I think a lot of the need now is around implementation, science, uh, operationalizing it, how we structure it, how we integrate it, how we embed it in the bigger structures within, between which it often, on, often works. Um, the minister mentioned the WHO uh, scoping review, which was published in 2019, which uh, brought it uh, up to a global level in terms of people's awareness of the evidence base. And I know that that has an, is having an impact on their policy, and there will be policy coming from the WHO in the next year or so, which will um, be significant for the UK and Ireland. So, so it, there is a lot to do, there always is. It's not as though we're ever going to get to the end yeah. of the evidence um, base, but uh, I think we need to start thinking about it slightly differently. But I mean, in the UK, you've set up the National Centre for Creative Health. Mm -hmm. So is that what you mean by embedding this? Uh, well, not, that, not is, that is a charity, so it's yeah. not, it's not a, a governmental organisation, um, but it's aim, its mission is to really look at systems change. Yeah. So I think the minister also touched on that. This is really about culture change within established ways of doing things. I think yes. one of the ways that's helpful to think about it is in terms of innovation, particularly in a healthcare context. So if you think around about innovation in health and how long it takes for new ways of thinking and working to be embedded, this is not dissimilar to that. And it's a the creative process itself is obviously um, quite closely aligned to innovation, but often it's around the adoption of innovation, with the what works for who, where, and how do different um, contexts affect mm. the development of something that maybe has been shown to work somewhere else. Well, Tom, if, if I can move to you as, as head of Healthy Ireland in the Department of Health, and I think there has been a bit of a cultural revolution in terms of persuading people that there really is a, different, a, a connection between their, their lifestyle, the amount of exercise they take, and, um, and, and their health. Um, but are you already well persuaded and down the path 
of realising that similar benefits can come from the link with creativity and health? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the evidence base is, is very strong. I don't think anybody's in a position or is, is trying to, to dispute that. I think, as the Minister alluded to, the challenge there for us in Healthy Ireland, which is a cross-government initiative uh, with our partners in the HSC, across government, in the NGOs, in the community sector, mm -hmm. is to try and break down some of the, I suppose, silos that have traditionally existed. There's a lot of really good work going on, and, and I think we've made great progress in, in, that, um, in that way. Some of our key initiatives that are run through the HSE and the local authorities are, are done in a collaborative way. We, through our Healthy Ireland Fund and our Healthy Communities Programme, which the Minister alluded to, by the end of uh, Q3, we'll have 50 full-time health and wellbeing officials embedded in the local authorities. They will work with their counterparts um, who are on the creative side. They will work with the people in the local communities to identify things that can be done. So and already you have a sort of a template. Exactly. I, I believe the infrastructure is there. Um, and there are opportunities there through the health and wellbeing uh, funding initiatives to further uh, develop the, the creative and arts areas. And I, but I, I do think this, the global uh, evidence base is very strong, but I think it's important that any new initiatives that we do, that we have a strong evidence base to report back on how they affect within the areas, because our, our entire approach is on a settings-based approach, and we need to tailor the interventions for, for, for the local areas that we're working within. And I think if we do that, we can continue to build the momentum and work with our partners across government and, and the HSE. Yeah, because there always will come a time where you have to put the argument again, and you have to be ready to put the <coughs> argument again, particularly maybe when money is tight and, and that, that sort of thing. And Tom, has it struck you that, because um, it struck me, if you go to the opera, the ballet, whatever, um, the people there are better off. People with better incomes and better education, in a way, have probably already taken this, this message on board. In, in a way, the state's job will be to make sure that that message spreads nationally, broadly. Uh, so, I mean, we know that uh, our communities in lower socioeconomic areas have much poorer outcomes in terms of life expectancy, in terms yeah. of non-communicable diseases, and our Healthy Communities Programme, which is um, based in the 19 of our, I suppose, most needed communities, is set up to do just that, and not just within the creative and art sector, but in the health and well-being, in terms of trying to address the wider determinants of health, because we know that health is not just determined on one or two factors, it's a cross yeah. spectrum of things. And what our program is doing, working with our partners across government and the local authorities and the HSE, is trying to address that and actually bring the message and provide additional healthcare supports and embedding people on the ground to work with the communities to identify their needs and empower them and educate them, but give them supports that they need around the various health and wellbeing initiatives that we're rolling out. And, and hearing what they want. Well, well, that's key, well. and that, yeah, that's why we're putting, we, we have a dedicated person in each of these 19 communities within the local authorities. We have significant investment through the HSE, but those 19 people are actually working with the community uh, to find out what they want. There's no point in me sitting in Baggett Street in a lovely office deciding what the needs are for Donegal or Limerick or, or Dublin North. Mm -hmm. We need to find out, and that's why we've put those people, there are boots on the ground to actually embed them within the communities. They'll tell you quickly enough. They sure will, too. Yeah. 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 Tanya, yeah. um, I mean, probably all of us sitting here have been lucky enough to have the sort of backgrounds where we took it for granted that things like music and, and, and art and, and all the other aspects of the arts uh, were a good thing. But wh where does that start? I mean, it starts obviously with parents, but what about within the education system? Is there a real opportunity to embed that idea there and are we doing it? I think so, and I think that's why the Creative Ireland programme is kind of an exciting integrated approach. So there's a huge amount happening both in schools and out of school settings, which is about bringing the creative community into the schools, bringing creativity into how we teach the teachers of the future, how do inspectors inspect schools? How do we literally build the fabric of our schools? So there's a whole piece of work around children and young people. And as Tom and the minister mentioned, we, we are essentially funding 
parallel structures as the state. So you've got your healthy Ireland person, you've got your creative Ireland person, you have your arts officers in local authorities, you have social prescribers, you have, in other words, there's traveller health promotion units. There are all of these things being funded by different arms of the state and they're not really linking together well yet. Now, I think this is an important first step. This is all of us going, A, there's great practice, but there's huge opportunities to work smarter. Well, in the job that you're in, to a certain extent, you're probably one of the people who is co coordinating uh, this message. I is, is there a difficulty? I mean, if you're getting in at the ground at the educational level, um, what sort of difficulties do you come up against? Does it mean you've I think there's three, there's three areas we need to think about, and we've thought about this as a group. The first is, okay, what's happening on the ground? How do we knit all these things together? The second step, like today, is an important step. How do we build awareness and understanding at senior level? So it's wonderful to have senior policymakers from the HSC, from acute hospitals, from the Department of Health here, because when it comes to, as you say, Olivia, the crunch that will come, you know, we need to be in the policies. And there's been some great first steps. So obviously, our, our program has been extended for five more years with a really explicit health and well-being pillar. That's good to hear. Yeah. Tom has got, yeah. you know, the Healthy Ireland has got being creative as part of its work. The new HSE health promotion, um, is that called Staying Well? The, the mental health promotion strategy. In other words, where there are policies being developed, either in the HSE or the Department of Health, are we making sure that arts and culture and creativity is in those policies so that when difficult times come there is a commitment by the state to do this so it needs to be happening locally and it needs to be valued at senior level because i would have come from a generation where at school you chose if you weren't really very good at the old maths and science you chose art and art was the sort of the one that everybody could do. Asher, your grand, you know, do do art. Um, and uh, I mean, I would have hoped that attitude has changed. Oh my God! Well, even <laughs> if we take it at its most basic economic level, creativity is going to be the fifth most sought-after skill worldwide. It is mm. absolutely a core competency for young people. If you think they're going to have multiple jobs in their lives, so I hope that attitude is dying out, Olivia. That we are we are saying that creativity and obviously within that arts and culture but not only is absolutely something that is is to be valued is a totally valid career choice and is something no matter what area you work in you're going to need still kids aren't stupid and they know that accountants and economists make a great deal more money than poets do Yes, but so do med tech workers, workers in the tech industry, of which we have many, all of which when you talk to the big multinationals based here in Ireland and you ask them on what basis they recruit, all of them have the kind of uh, intake processes that put an emphasis on being creative. Tom, there's a, a phrase that's, that's used, and when I was talking to people before this conference, I had to get a definition of what it meant. Social prescribing. Can you put that in ordinary words for me? Uh, yeah, I suppose the easiest way I would describe it is that social prescribing is a, where a person within the healthcare sector, the community sector, will link uh, a patient with, or, uh, forget the word, a, a community person with social um, uh, sort of initiatives mm. that might benefit their overall well-being. So this could be physical activity, it could be a knitting class, it could be a men's shed group, or it could be a creative and arts program. Mm. So social prescribing, the HSE launched their, their social prescribing framework in 2021, and it's embedded kind of across uh, various CHOs. There are a number of link workers in place, and uh, it's been shown to work really well. So we, we, we want in the healthcare system to move people away from the acute settings, we want to move people away, un unless they require uh, the, the, those settings. We want to move them away from always necessarily looking for everything from their GP. So we have these systems in place whereby the people within the areas will know the groups and the supports that are available, and they can link people with those. And it, it's, it's quite a simple model, but I think it's quite a, it, I think it's generally accepted that it's a very good model and it's working really well. And it's something a lot in the UK, isn't it? Yes, what, what about yes. the UK? Well, it, I, um, it started really in a sense because GPs 
uh, at least 30% of people who attend their GP are going for a non-clinical reason. They may have uh, medical issues, but the actual causes and the problems are non-medical. They might be around loneliness uh, or isolation. They might be around mild depression and anxiety. Uh, they might be around debt and issues around just survival. So that recognition from our health services led to the establishment of a, a very strong commitment in the NHS 10-year plan in 2020 to um, funding link workers. So social prescribing link workers are now in every primary care network in the country. Um, and they can refer people via, from the GP or from other um, health professionals to community support of one sort or another. And the arts and culture is one of the four pillars. So they talk about arts and culture, physical activity, um, debt relief, and those kind of social supports, and the natural environment, access to the natural environment. Of course, arts and culture works across physical activity and the natural environment, and you don't necessarily need to separate those all out. Um, there are some challenges, because then um, the mechanisms by which that, that service is funded uh, if it's funded through health budgets or through arts budgets, it is something that's still being considered. But another thing which um, Tom sort of referred to in a way is this idea of how you work at a place. So you have, and that's very much a health service structure, everywhere has its, its similar structures, doesn't it? And you have people in each geographic location. And in our country, that is now, um, in, in a, at statutory level, the new Health and Care Act um, enables integration at a place level, what are called integrated care systems, which bring together health, local authorities, and the voluntary community sector. So, of course, the arts and culture has to be in there, but it's all those, those um, mechanisms that need to still be sorted out. But, I mean, Tom, before you prescribe socially, you have to be sure that the sort of services that you think would be good for a person are there. Mm. And... and I mean, the, the question is investment. I mean, is there enough investment in, in, in the UK? In the provider, if you like, if you could call it the provider market. No, there's a lot of work being done on that. So, you know, what they sometimes call marketplace development. So how do you support communities to provide this community support? How do you invest in communities? A lot of it is very grassroots. Some of it is, is volunteer-led. Other, you know, it's, it's very complex, that community work and sort of asset-based community development. So the other thing I'd just sort of bring into the discussion is how you bring the voice of the people, people, the service users, the patients, the people with lived experience, into all of this change is also very powerful. Well, and I think we'll hear some of those yeah. voices in the films, but I yeah. think the problem is, and many of these people are here in the audience, these champions, there are people who've been doing that for years, the, islands yes, of brilliant the practice, yes. the people who are committed, yes. whether they would be healthcare workers, artists, there are people who absolutely believe in it. But the question is, how do you get it valued further up the food chain? Mm. Because otherwise, if that brilliant, passionate person burns out, mm. it, it comes to nothing. And I think that's what we're really keen, I, I'm sure all of us here as a group are, is to say, we, we've got to get beyond the sole champion into integrating it into policies. So how do you get beyond the solution? Well, I mean, I, I think there's a real effort to do that. Mm. That's what we're doing as a group at the moment in, yeah. in, in terms of looking at a number of pilots. But more importantly than the pilots, I think, is thinking about how do we embed this across the structures that are, that are there. So the, like the funding model is always very complex because there's lots of funding going into lots of areas. But I think the challenge for us and, and part of our mandate in Healthy Ireland is to look at that on a unilateral basis in, in terms of what is the state doing in the most deprived communities? What is the state doing on a community level? What can we do in the creative and art side to ensure that the right interventions are available for the, for the people in these communities to support their, their health and well-being? There's a, an abundance of, of research around flow and positive psychology and social connection. And all of these initiatives, when people actually access them, get the benefit of that. And we know from our most recent Healthy Ireland survey that people have reported a reduction in their overall mental health and their, and their well-being during the COVID period. So there's, there's a lag from that. And I think it's, it's more important than ever that we actually continue to do that and do it, do it better and continue to improve. I mean, Alexandra, one of the arguments that's put forward uh, for the importance of the arts and, and of creativity um, uh, for people and the connection with health is that it helps to address inequality, social inequality, mm -hmm. which I would have thought would be quite important, particularly if one was putting the political argument 
uh, for, for um, the arts. And is there evidence of that? There is evidence, but I think it is very complex territory. As everyone knows, yeah. it's very in, difficult to, to shift. And obviously, COVID has revealed health inequalities very starkly and made them worse. Um, some of the research that we're involved in at the moment, so I can't say we've got the evidence, but it's very active, is around health inequalities. So this is looking at community assets, what are broadly called community assets, which includes arts and culture, but also includes the natural environment, access to, to libraries, community centres, green spaces, how that impacts on um, people's health and well-being in the most deprived communities. And there is evidence that, for instance, um, a young person with mental health challenges in coming from a poorer background is less likely to engage in community assets for whatever reasons. There are barriers, maybe they just aren't there, or, you know, for whatever reasons. But if they do, the improvement in their mental health is more than if they come from an affluent background. So there's some quite interesting evidence around that. And I think public health policy is recognising the importance of the, 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 the individual in their community, so the, 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 the social connections, the social um, the networks, how that benefits not only the individual's health, but how that can affect the, the whole community. So I think the, the arts and culture has a really important role. Creativity yeah. itself has a really important role in that. But I wouldn't say, I, I can't talk to the evidence. Yeah. Um, I think it's a growing evidence base and a focus for research. But but it, it's interesting, Tanya, isn't it, if one remembers the old Soviet Union, the extent to which art for the people was, you know, a central tenet. Mm -hmm. And there were subsidised tickets to the ballet, to the opera, whatever. And people like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, when he defected, found that life in America was much less rich mm -hmm. in that way in terms of access to the arts from you know, those who were not well, well off. Well, maybe Creative Ireland is a Soviet programme exactly. then, Olivia, because <laughs> exactly. in a way exactly. that's the government saying if the health and well-being of the people of Ireland is our greatest asset, we as a government are saying that creativity is important to health and well-being. So to have somebody like Catherine Martin say it literally covers climate change, health and well-being, young people in schools. So there is an attitude by this this government certainly and hopefully future ones which is we do want this these opportunities for everybody to be creative so it is not something only for professional artists all of us have this capacity we know the benefits it brings if the, the health and well-being of people is the greatest asset how do we mainstream creativity into everything that we do and how will you, just particularly uh, in Creative Ireland? Well, obviously, one strand is through our work with young people in and out of school, um, and that means getting the Department of Children, education, culture, further education, a bit like we've talked about health, working together better. In health, it's the HSE, the Department of Health, the Arts Council and ourselves. So it's that idea, that awful term, networking the networks. It is awful, but ultimately there are lots of structures, but working together. If you think about the projects there in the ante room, I often think, we've said it before time, you only get to know somebody by working with them. Mm. So what we said was, let's just do something. Let's just get projects that are good, let's elevate them or for cohorts, uh, members of our community like travellers who have very, very poor health outcomes. It's, it's a shocking statistic. Can we do something together? Let's bring these networks together. So partly it's doing, showing what does good look like. And the second piece is the research and evidence, and you'll hear from Professor Kenny later. And the third is the policy. All those uh, officials like ourselves who are working on policies, get it into national policy. There's, okay. there's a real opportunity in local policy as well at the moment because the local authorities um, are preparing their local economic and community plans, LECPs, I hope I got the, that's definitely the acronym, I'm not sure, but they're, they're going to be planning for the next five years and one of the pillars within the LECPs is health and wellbeing. So through our boots on the ground with Healthy Ireland and Creative Ireland people, we will be influencing the direction of travel for the local mm. authorities. So we have it on our national policies, we get it on our local policies, we embed health and well-being, in particular on the creative and art side as well, to make sure that they're there as deliverables, mm. and that's how you drive things on. Because if it isn't in a policy, it isn't going to, you know, you're just not going to get traction for it. Okay. And, I, and I think this is an opportunity to do that. Okay, well, I mean, as we've all learned, the, the pictures 
tells a story a thousand times better than words do. So we're going to go a little bit early to our video. Catherine Martin's wonderful. You never have a politician who actually speaks briefly and absolutely to the point and effectively, <laughs> but she did, God bless her, she did. So we're going to uh, say, uh, ask our panel to join us now um, in the audience. Uh, because we are going to show you uh, a, 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 a very heartwarming um, video. Um, it's a video of, of creativity at work in an acute hospital setting. Uh, it was shot earlier this month in the paediatric ward of University Hospital Waterford with uh, our partners, Waterford Healing Arts Trust. You're going to love this. Thank you, thank you Unicorn for helping us and for saving us. And again the wind picked up those voices, carried them over the hills, over the mountains, over the forest. And the Unicorn's ears, they pricked and heard their thanks. We've been um, bringing our work here to University Hospital Waterford for over, almost 30 years can only do this work because of the amazing champions that work on the ground, the healthcare champions. Like children can be a very perceptive audience, you know, they, you have to work very hard at getting their attention, so he's a great skill in getting their attention and they all love him. A hospital is a very scary place, you know, and there's lots going on and there's people coming to do tests and you're getting blood tests and you've got this lovely moment then for an hour when you've got, you're doing your painting, you're doing something nice or someone is telling you a nice story. And it's, um, it's become very much part of, of the ward. You know, it's like the, the sessions are as part of the ward as, as a reporter or huddles or any other things. It's, it's, a, it's become part of our day and very much welcomed. It's a very therapeutic power, what Joe does. He comes in, his storytelling. It's a lovely hour where they're distracted, they're happy. As the nurses say, it transforms the ward for that hour into a play area. To me, the biggest benefit is it, it's a change in the atmosphere or it's a change in the mood for them. It takes them out of only thinking about being in the hospital and what's going on, what's coming next, am I going to be okay? And it just takes them into a completely different space where they can relax, they can wander in their imagination and dream and have fun. And that is the real key thing. It just lifts their whole spirit. And it also works, particularly like in the paediatric world, it's the parents get that as well. They're just so relieved that there's a change and it just shifts the mood and takes the mind off of what's going on for that bit of time at least. So I certainly think the arts and creativity is vital and should be a daily part of a child or even indeed any patient's recovery programme. The children's faces I thought were wonderful in, in, in that video. Well, our next panel are going to join us now, so could we ask Professor Roseanne Kenny, uh, Director of MISA, St. James's Hospital, and Principal Investigator of, um, of TILDA, the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging. Um, Dr. Michael O'Connor, Geriatrician at Cork University Hospital and National Clinical Advisor and Group Lead for Acute Operations at the HSE, and Natalie Wiedig, Irish Architectural Foundation, um, who's here with us, and also Dr. Eilish Hardiman, CEO, Children's Health um, Ireland. Um, there she is. Hi, Eilish. Good morning. <laughs> uh, Roseanne, yes. um, you've been doing wonderful work on this business too of um, creativity with with getting older and the link with, with keeping well in, in, in that way. Give us an example of what you've done in terms of creativity for older people at St. James's uh, Acute Hospital Creative Life Programme. Well, we have a new institute for um, ageing at St. James's, um, thanks to the HSE, Department of Health, but of course a philanthropic gift by Chuck Feeney. And I love, it's great that we have an opportunity to acknowledge him publicly like this. Um, and we have four pillars there. One is the clinical pillar. It's in the hospital. There are 120 beds, a rehabilitation center, etc. Two is um, education and training, and that's across all, all staff disciplines. Three 
is research, very heavily embedded in our clinical practice and in creativity. And four, the fourth pillar of equal standing to the other three is the creative life pillar. <clears throat> so when you walk into the institute, you, you're just met with colour and, and, and thank you to Creative Ireland, but also the Arts Council who have worked with us in, in, in rotating um, visual arts. There's music, there's... That I, what, I love Joe Brennan. <laughs> I'd be pulling him in mm. to our older care wards um, with, with storytelling, etc. So, so there's a creative hub that greets you. The interesting thing is that the Institute is a footfall from the Lewis Station and from other, for other access for the local community. And of course, we're the second most deprived um, area in, in Ireland. And, and very often, in the context of socioeconomic status and deprivation, we were alluding to earlier on. You know, maybe communities who never get an opportunity to expose themselves to creativity are doing it fortuitously because that's the footfall through the institute into the main hospital. So, so, so that's what we've done in terms of in infrastructure, environment, activities, and then of course there's a knock-on just for staff a huge positive benefit for the from the environmental activities and very, very dominant during COVID, but also, of course, for patients, both outpatients, and we have a footfall of 30,000 ambulatory care patients in that space every year, but also in, in patients. So, so that's the infrastructure. And then we've worked very closely with um, Tanya's group in Creative Ireland in embedding creativity questions into the TILDA uh, wave so that we understand at a population level, a representative population level, the experience of creativity. And interestingly, we had those questions in before COVID and we put some in during a COVID wave. So we know the beneficial impact that COVID, during COVID, that creativity had and new creative activities also on m particularly mental health and disposition. Mm. And I know just from talking to teachers who would work in more deprived areas that um, they very quickly discovered that the way to engage kids who might not have responded to the usual chalk and talk approach was the play, uh, the musical, something yeah. with performance in yeah. it. And suddenly there was excitement yeah. at school. And one of the things kids told me about COVID that they really, really resented and missed was the fact that the usual school opera, school musical, yeah. whatever yeah. it was they did, yeah. was denied to them. Yeah. Because for youngsters, this was maybe the first time they got to be on stage and yeah. command an audience and yeah. feel what it was like, to the power of being yeah. able to do that. Um, Eilish, looking back to our video of the activities in, in the paediatric ward of University Hospital Waterford, how important is play in, in children's recovery? Yeah, oh, it, it is central actually to uh, how we work in a children's hospital and congratulations to our colleagues actually in Waterford, they're very good colleagues of ours in trying to ensure that we um, very much embed arts in, in the widest sense, you know, that's the, the visual, the storytelling, but also the performance arts in how we operate in children's hospitals. So we actually employ um, play specialists, um, music therapists, um, we employ artists actually to come in to our children's hospitals and engage uh, with the children to actually explore that creativity. Um, it has been well researched and the evidence has been quite clear about how it can actually help with, with healing. Uh, but for us, it's really important because, you know, we're dealing with, um, you know, tiny, tiny babies that are premature, right up to 18 year olds. So um, how they connect, how they express, how they're able to articulate, how they're experiencing is, we use um, art, uh, the artists to do that. So simple one is we have a child who was dying who didn't really talk about it, but yet wrote a song with the music therapist all about how he was feeling and sung it as he switched on the, the lights and the Christmas tree, not a dry eye in the audience, but it was really important because it was the first time ever he actually expressed how he was feeling. So it's really important that because as children, as you say, respond through play. So we use it all the time to um, in our when they're going to theatre, you know, they go in a, a car to theatre, they're driving to theatre. We use them, we've got um, Toy Story and Disney even involved in our imaging department where, you know, um, 
Buzz Lightyear gets x-rayed beside them, you know, and all of this thing, and it's all about their world and understanding their world and bringing it out creatively and engaging with them to actually um, inform them of what's going on and try to get them maybe to tell us how they want to be, or how they want to be treated. And we have um, huge art programs, which is, uh, and the artists, uh, I have to say, are fantastic coming into a healthcare setting uh, to be able to, you know, be in that world of creativity and art and, you know, just a fabulous world, and yet ensure they engage the children and work within a clinical environment. So it's, it is really special, and the staff absolutely value it. But one of the things I would say, and, and, and I know all Roseanne's all work because my previous life was with them in, in Medell, but it is hard, and I heard all the things about policy, which is great, but actions is where it, it matters. We need the policy, but I go in looking for, you know, I'd like more clear therapists and more music therapists and some nurses. You, you see what I'm going to get, you know. And so there's an argument of whereby we've got to create, I think, greater evidence and, and demonstrate in, in a real way through research and through awareness about the actually meaningful impact. Because when we talk to children, they talk about those experiences or the parents talk about, my God, that's the first time I've seen my child's face the normal way it is in hospitals yeah, with, with, yeah. with that artist present. And you said something quite important there about the children perhaps making the hospital setting more their world, creating a little bit of their world within the, the hospital setting. Totally, and in designing the new children's hospital, we were very cognizant of that. So we've had a whole program, and we began at the beginning, so we actually recruited an art and health curator, and she's in the audience, Mary, I'll embarrass her here, but, and, and she came from Waterford, and, and we actually have support. So from the very beginning, we bed, that's how it is in the organization. It's not an add-on, it's not a not-for-profit association, it's embedded in how we're going to be there. So we have, you know, spaces that are for artists to actually perform in the hospital. We have performance spaces in the new hospital. We actually have galleries, we have digital walls. We have all of this that has been built in, designed with the children and young people. And it has been, it's really, really important considering, you know, the last few years that we've been through, you know, that um, in paediatrics, while well, COVID didn't Im impact children, but mental health uh, has definitely deteriorated for yeah. our young people. So we have found and again, using um, the artists has been a very creative way because it's a challenging time being teenagers and how they're able to express themselves. But they do that through um, art and creativity better than sitting down even talking to some of the professionals. Okay. So it's integral yeah. to what we do and really, really important. And we're going to go to Natalie Wiedek in a minute about how hospitals are designed. But uh, Michael O'Connor, Michael, you have the big picture of acute hospitals and, and how they're organised within the HSE to deliver health services. What can be done with the hospital settings to make it easier to deliver um, creativity as part of, 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 of health care? And is there always going to be this tug, we have to deliver the acute care first? Yeah, and uh, maybe just the first reflection, I just thought as a geriatrician that I, I, over the last 10 years I should have maybe sang O Solo Mio right through my ward <laughs> and so done infinitely more good than maybe by prescribing medications and the like. But there is a challenge, and I think if you look at our hospitals, we have a, a network of six hospital groups and, and, and CHI also. They're coordinating 50 hospitals across the country that were designed purely for delivering health care not for any other purpose really. It is around the workflow of the people who work in the hospitals and that is a problem. Now there are fantastic examples we've just heard about the, the children's hospital which really is going to be fantastic but I've had the opportunity recently to visit a couple of hospitals, Harold's Cross, the new hospice there, Piemont, mm -hmm. uh, a place where well-being is plugged into to actually what happens. If you look what happens in, in, in spending and health and this goes right across acute and community it's 22 billion. Uh, and there are some theories and some evidence that actually, if you look at the spending that we do in health, about 60% of it is really adding value. About 30% of it is of dubious value. And about 10% of it is actively causing harm. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities there, really, from the funding perspective. Tell us about the bits that are causing harm. <laughs> yeah, I could. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> Nothing that any of us have had in the room. No, there, there are, there's, there's duplication. There are lots of things that people are over-investigated. Uh, they have treatment at the end of life, uh, particularly, and I don't, I don't want to say that this is the norm now. This obviously is the norm. You know, very advanced chemotherapy that I wouldn't put my hands up for myself. And I'm speaking frankly here, uh, 
There are operations that people have that really don't need operations, particularly elective and planned operations. And yes. I think we have to be conscious yes. that, that actually yeah. health care can, can cause harm as we prescribe. It might so have been much more important for that person to be able to look out on a garden and a green correct. space. Correct, yeah. correct, mm -hmm. correct. correct. Yeah. So th there are challenges, and, and I think that there are very good examples of good, as we've heard from Elish and obviously other hospitals, and I think we have to get our act together. You heard about the, the Soviet nature of Creative Ireland. The HSE is a bit Soviet in its organisation as well, so, <laughs> so, so there may be opportunities there. But I think it's events like this, actually, that focus the mind, that, that really do focus the mind. Natalie, this is all arriving on your doorstep, like Molly Bloom's <laughs> soliloquy at the end of Ulysses. Um, What's wrong with the way hospitals are built? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that one, the first of all. Um, no, not everything. Um, I think it, in order to answer that question, I think it would be interesting to go back and actually um, talk about architecture as central to healthcare. And um, I believe, as the director of the IAF, that architecture can save lives. And I think that, and I'll explain that a bit further because that's a very big statement, but I think that um, we all have felt through COVID, the, um, uh, we've all had to ask ourselves a new question anytime we entered a design space or a build space, will entering this space make me sick or not? So that's really, incredible. So the idea that buildings are not neutral, the idea that buildings have always impacted on healthcare is not new um, at all, but it's always something that is um, not thought about as much as other forms of creativity um, generally. And uh, I suppose this is one of the reasons why the Irish Architecture Foundation was formed, is really to raise awareness um, about the quality and value of architecture and its impact on people. And as Tanya says, um, it's like showing what good looks like. But for us, and this is what we do in the IEF through Open House Dublin, um, like for instance, look at this building. This is in Open House Dublin. This room is one of the best rooms in the city. When you walked in here, you couldn't help but feel awe at this wonderful timber ceiling, which I believe no as nails were used, um, I believe, and it was a racquetball court, and all of these wonderful things about our cultural history about buildings that we kind of overlook, and that we address that in the IEF, and we try to. Um, and uh, but like, and you were saying about the um, the the tenor who is playing music, like every, like Gotha said, that architecture is frozen music. Um, and when you walk into this space, you feel a sense of awe, and I believe, but, but also, but it's important to understand that the everyday can be transformed by the architect or the designer as well, so it's, it, they, can, they can adapt or work with any client or any situation. But in terms of hospital design, just to go back, sorry, I'm digressing slightly. No, but it's very interesting because, but it, you know, it's one of the things I felt walking into this room because of the massive size up there, was suddenly a sense of potential, yeah. of hope, yes, uh, yes, of yes. room to expand. Yeah, exactly. And architecture can do this. I mean, and this is something that our uh, Pritzker Prize winning architects, Yvonne Farrell um, and Shelley McNamara, mm -hmm. and the Pritzker Prize is, is like the Nobel Prize for architecture. It's, it's, it's an incredible accolade for Irish architects to get. They talk about this all the time. They talk about the generosity of space, the, 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 that humanity is core and key to that. And that's where hospital design is going, and you probably can attest to this now, which is great, but, it's, but, but let's I'll go back in history. I just was reading, actually, it was really interesting, just, just reading, and by the way, I'm not an expert in ho hospital design. I'm mm. an expert on awareness, um, um, people, and architecture, and that type of thing, the cultural value of architecture. But um, Florence Nightingale, um, who we all know, um, she wrote a, um, a document, almost like a toolkit for designers, called um, hang on, I'll notes on hospitals, published in 1858. So she designed hospitals that put patients and nurses, carers, to the center. Um, obviously, she was worried about disease spreading through air, so she designed the pavilion-style hospital where um, um, buildings were segregated. And that was in um, 1858. Now, in Dublin, by the way, we have 
and she was a pioneer. And we still, now we look to Florence Nightingale, actually, when they were designing the COVID um, sort of centers um, in the UK, they looked to the, her book. Yeah. So, um, but uh, in Dublin, actually, and there's a great building on Cork Street, the Brew Queen, um, do you know it? Yeah. Do, do you see that building, right? So you've got like, it's, it's, it's the pavilion style, and this is 50 years earlier. So yeah, not, Florence Nightingale was a pioneer, but we were doing it actually in Dublin back then. So, and we've been trying to get this building into open house um, loads of times, and we've actually made a film about it because it's a very busy building, as you can imagine, so it's really hard to, for us to put it into a festival, and we understand that. But um, there, we do have a short film on our website, on the open house website about it. But that building was designed, you have, a, it's actually, the real title is the house of the fever hospital and the house of recovery so you have two buildings with a clock tower in the center which was the administrative building one building was the fever hospital one building was the house of recovery joined by um, a, um, a corridor um, and loads of windows sunlight ventilation etc blah, blah blah all that sort of stuff this is 1804 and then so then just move ahead in time to i would say so if that was the rise, the fall, possibly, of hospital design in the 50s, which is actually connected to um, uh, uh, technological, um, uh, what you call it, advances in medicine. Mm. It was, there was the widespread use of antibiotics, all of these things, so hospitals came sealed. You know what I mean? There was, the, the, there was a, more of a use of um, air conditioning, that type of thing, so windows, all of those things became less important. Mm. Um, and that happened and that so technology and medicine are all completely connected to hospital design and now though we are entering to end on my trip through history we are entering a new era which is putting back carers people patients the holistic approach and i think in terms of when you're talking about um art in hospitals and creativity in hospitals that programming hospitals is one thing, but the design of what happens in them is so hugely important. It's like, it's like separating the software from the hardware. You have to put them both together. But just a few simple oh, sorry. things. No, it's grand. This is all very okay. enlightening and elevating. Um, but can I ask some just straightforward idiot questions? Um, can we learn, for instance, from the way hospices are set out? Mm. Can we learn from hospitals that have lots of green space and gardens around them? I mean, are there a few even simple rules about the height of ceilings or light? Absolutely, completely, of course. And hospitals now are taking into consideration that they are not just about interior spaces, it's also about outdoor spaces, but it's also about they are part of the city. Hospitals are taking up huge chunks of um, the city. They're like, um, I live in Rialto, and I've seen it pop up, and I, it's, I'm excited about how that's going to change the community in Rialto. You know, so it goes even beyond just the patient in the bed. It's from the bed to the city. Um, okay. That's not a simple answer to your question, but all of these things are taken into consideration. They have lots of green spaces and gardens. Lots of green spaces are very, very important, and there are really good examples of, of hospices like yeah. the the, um, the Harrow's Cross Hospice, hospice, and also the the hospice on the Curra. The hospice on the curb. Yeah, green mm. green spaces Beautiful. all around. And it's so yeah. crucially yeah. important to give that access to all of those things. As to quote Shelley and Yvonne again from Grafton Architects, light and sun and all of these are free, mm. but they are mm. crucial materials in designing buildings. They are as important as bricks and timber. They are, they're, they're, they're not physical, but they are used if you get the right designers, and this is where the creativity comes into it, and the right people to work in that team. And by the way, architects don't know everything. They may think they do, but they don't. Yeah. But you have to, you have to bring in, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, teams of different expertise in, okay. in, into designing hospitals, and that is the way forward. Is part of the problem, Michael, and thank you for that, um, is part of the problem the fact that hospital gets designed, it takes forever to get planning permission to agree where it's going to go, and by the time the thing starts to be built, it's, it, it, it's out of date. Um, I think it's probably deeper than that. I think it's actually the hospitals were designed for procedural outcomes and numbers of patients put through. 
if you look at there's a couple of figures here which I think are interesting. If you look at a day in the life of the health service, so there's 12, 13,000 outpatients in one day. That's about three million a year. Mm. Uh, in addition to that, there are 800 patients having hemodialysis per day. Uh, in addition to that, there are 4,000 day procedures done per day. It's a lovely statistic, 175 babies born every day, which is nice. And 4,000 people come to emergency departments every day. And we build those hospitals around those functions, which really doesn't describe actually the patient's experience. The patient's experience. There's a hospital, and you mentioned about the green spaces, uh, and it leans into your question. They're, they're coming from Cork, obviously, by my Cork accent. And we have a capacity issue in, in our own hospitals, and they're looking at a, a rebuilding or a new hospital in Cork. And there's a fairly obvious site, actually, which is called Sarsfield Court St. Stephen's Hospital, built uh, during the TB time. Noel Brown, who did amazing work, uh, really, in, 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 in battling that pandemic. And it has, it's, it's not currently used as a hospital. It has 105 acres surrounded by green. It has a nine-hole pitch and put cup, uh, golf course. And to me, seems like a blindingly obvious choice to, to build a hospital. So I think it's about the intent. What do you want to do? It's not so much about the whole planning permission, but it's actually having the vision that healthcare isn't about illness, actually. It's about well-being and promoting well-being. And we've missed that trick, really, to be quite honest. We've missed but that. But if it's about well-being, what role do hospitals play? Well, I, I, I mean, you know, you could look at them in their utilitarian view of actually, we just treat disease, get you better, and out you go. You know, and I think that that really is based, doing patients a, 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 a disservice. And we saw that completely and utterly nakedly during COVID, when everything that happened in the hospital was just the patients and just the staff. There were no, none of the added bits, none of the visiting bits, none of the librarians coming, none of the art therapists coming. Uh, and it was a dark and a bleak place. Now, there was lots of reasons why it was dark and bleak, as we all know, but it was cold, uh, dispassionate uh, for, for, for a place to yeah. work, really. Tense. And yeah. we have an atrium in, in the CUH, and there's a piano where a pianist used to come in twice a week, and that mm. fell silent. And there was a day in particular that one of our SHOs decided to open up the piano in a big, large open space and played music mm. at the height of the pandemic, and everybody stopped. Yeah. Everybody stopped patients, staff, a bit like the moment that we had, the most beautiful moment this morning, really, that, yeah, that actually that, that, that lifted the soul, really, you know, so. Yeah. And Roseanne, from your point of view, and you're a sort of a hybrid person because you're already persuaded of the importance of creativity in terms of, of health. Looking at hospitals, what design-wise is what you would see would be the great requirement to allow the development of the sort of links between creativity and health that you If like. I could just reflect a little bit on one thing that mm. Mike said there about, you know, we're utilitarian, etc. But I, I think of creativity, there's biological evidence for this as an antioxidant. Okay, it reduces inflammation, it reduces stress, both physiological, psychological stress and physiological stress. So it decelerates any negative processes in our trillions of cells. Therefore, it, it is a clear adjunct to intervention and therapy. In other words, you can measure it. We can measure it. You yeah. can actually do biological measures of the yeah. impact, okay? Hard, yeah. objective biological measures. Green space is part of that. The feeling you get when you walk into an environment is part of that. So bottom line, the tagline should be when somebody walks into a hospital, they should say, I don't feel like I'm in a hospital. Yeah. That's what you want. And that's, in, in, in some of the spaces that we have, that's what people say. I don't feel like I'm in a hospital. That's great. That's what you want. Um, but there's, there's, there's good evidence that it will re I reduce length of stay and, 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 and decelerate negative processes that might have been triggered by whatever the acute process is. And it's, not, it's also an opportunity using creativity to bridge these silos that we have that are hospitals and then what's happening in the community. You know, it's a segue to both. So, so we, we should be using it to en enhance that engagement and that pathway from hospital to community and back in again through the system. Eilish, this is a conversation that has to be had. And very often, in fact, generally, uh, one finds in the area of health and often with the medical profession, language is a big problem. Finding 
the language if you are somebody who believes in creativity and the, 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 the acceptance of, of creativity and the arts as an, an aid to well-being. What, how does one find a language in which medics, people who organize hospitals, can talk to people in the, in the art world? You don't need to tell artists. Artists know the value mm -hmm. of art and music and, and all the rest of it. They're fine. But how do you bridge that gap? Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and it's a little bit like architects, artists and health, because we're in different worlds. And it's amazing to see when they come together, um, they sometimes have a perception of how the other's world should be seen. It's only through engagement and very well facilitated engagement. And that's what's perfect about um, artists who are used to being in the health world, they act as a bridge. They can see where the, the medic or the clinician is maybe struggling with, what are they trying to do here? This is like a, can I see the benefits of that? And then what they do, like what Roselle says, is they have some very clear evidence-based material to back up. So for example, with again going back to children who actually have you know, MRI scanners and they need, to be, um, they need to be in there for about 45 minutes. So um, no, what child is going to stay still for 45 minutes? And so they tend to be anaesthetized. But what we have discovered is that if the play therapist and the artists work with them, they actually are staying still because they're able to watch a movie or listen to a story and they don't need to be anaesthetized. When you start saying that to clinicians, they're going, now this matters. This matters because we don't need to be doing that. We don't, you know, this is harm. This is part of the harm that we could be doing. So it is about getting those nuggets of, particularly, I think, for clinic evidence to demonstrate that this is worth it. But then I find a lot of our clinicians are quite artistic anyway. Now, so you've got to work with the champions and uh, actually to do that. And then you've got to put them into the world together and, and just get them to engage. And it's important to understand. Somebody needs to sometimes understand the language. So we find artists, also some people, other like, like um, medical physics and clinical engineering, we have a lot of them who are very interested in art, as we know, and they're able to sometimes identify the bridging techniques that actually are able to get both worlds to see each other, each, each other's side. So it really is important. And then with children then, I mean, it's so, so different because it has to be visual, it has to be drawing, it has to be sound. You know, it, words are, are a challenge. And, but even like we have, um, you, you saw the storytelling there. So we actually now are weaving in stories into the, how you get the wayfinding around the children's hospital. The children are saying how this is, because they have to come in and it has to make sense to them as much as everybody else. So it is really important that in, and we have built the hospital with 14 gardens, some of them dedicated to particular specialties because of their unique needs. Every child that's in has a vision has a view because they have to connect with, with nature. Every room can actually be open for fresh air. A big challenge in hospitals. We spent hours, days on some of these design matters because we, the children, the patients and the staff say, this matters. And that's why sometimes these things, it is big if you see the children's hospital, it's because we stuck to the design principles. We built them in at the beginning in the design brief and we stuck to them all the way along. And that is, that takes leadership and it takes commitment from the design team, but it does take the children and the, um, our, our colleagues who work with us in art and health constantly reminding us, this is about health and well-being. This is a core to our values this needs to be designed and built in. Now our challenge is to make sure we can operate it, and that's a good challenge. Well, Roseanne, just you know, continuing on this business of, of, of language, I mean, do, do you think at least it would be helpful if one could say, do you know what? This saves money. 100%. Hmm. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and I think there are a number of different approaches to that, again, which are valid um, and evidence-based. First of all, you get a much better productivity from your workforce mm. if they're working in a pleasant environment mm. um, and, 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 and a, a creative environment. That's the first thing. Secondly, if you're reducing length of stay, and there are some studies which have shown that, that's a big plus also. I mean, Mike is doing the rounds of the country at the moment, looking at overcrowding in hospitals, etc. Length of stay is a big, big issue. Thirdly, if it can be employed as part of the 
admission avoidance program, that would be a huge benefit because are there alternatives to admitting people into hospital that we can actually apply some sort of a day case program instead for people, avoid admission and build creativity because people have to be in hospital for, you know, maybe say six hours, but we're avoiding admission to hospital, getting everything done, one site, one stop process. During that period of time while your investigations and assessments are happening, let's be in an enjoyable creative space. That's another way of saving money. So I think there are lots of opportunities to put actually a euro against the benefits of creativity in the health service. Is that an important way, um, Mike, to, to put the it, it, it argument? Is. I mean, there's a very eloquent study done in Pennsylvania where they actually admitted patients to a ward looking out over a green space versus a wall. Pretty much the same conditions, and they used less medications, they were less anxious, and they stayed less time in hospital. So the evidence base is there. Uh, it's a matter of focusing the minds, though. Again, if you think about money that we spend, we spend half a billion on drugs in the hospitals. We spend about 1.5 billion in the community. Mm. And how much do we spend on social prescribing? Mm -hmm. you know, so, so I think we just need to create space for all of this discussion to move in centrally. And we have very clear policy in it now, and I think we need to join up the dots a little mm. bit, actually, on this space. Because it's clear, as, as a physician practicing for 30 years, and Roseanne similarly, this is pretty obvious to us now, really, to be honest. Yeah. As a younger physician, we were excited by, we were talking earlier about ECGs and bloods and we give this antibiotic. Now it's about life stories and connections to patients, really. So, yeah. so I think our challenge, though, because uh, that's an overarching answer, actually, is to mainstream this, really, to be honest. And events like this, I think, will help in that regard. Natalie, um, from the point of view, and you, you, you would be coming from the artistic direction, um, architecture is an art form too. Um, what about that business of, of the language, of, of talking to people? If you as an architect, for instance, are talking to people who are going to put a hospital together and you're stressing the need for the hospital in itself to be an art, a piece of art, which is what architecture is, what, what sort of difficulties language-wise do you come up with? deal with this all the time in the Architecture Foundation and in fact it was probably the reason why we were set up is to be that uh, connector between the architect and the general public in everything we do. So a lot of the work we do specifically through say the Reimagine programme which is funded by Creative Ireland um, and the Arts Council and the Department of um, rural and community and the Department of Housing, sorry, there's lots of partners in it now, um, because it's a program that's actually growing and there's a lot of demand for it. And we're in two healthcare centres at the moment, but just it started off as, be, as, as, as um, a program where we placed architects in communities um, and working with them in that, in, in a very, very determined co-design way. So we, we placed architects working with communities in need, and that was working within the built environment. We're currently in two healthcare settings now in Limerick Hospital, um, University Hospital, and Enniscorthy St. John's um, Hospital, currently now working on outdoor spaces, specifically for staff, because staff are key and important people within this whole um, conversation. Um, so the key to language is literally um, is actually the key to language is listening first of all if you're you know um, an architectural expert um, but we do very intensive workshoppings and discussions and mapping and talking about aspirations and all of those things um, in a sense I suppose we are the the I don't know the gateway to all of those things for these types of projects, but it's 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 really cru crucially important. Um, and again, we also we also talk to architects and train architects and how to speak to communities as well. So it's not just that we train communities or train yeah. users. We also it's it's a three way thing really. Okay, okay, Rosanna, I'm going to come to you, Mike. Somebody's going to come and fix your mic. I think it's fallen it's fallen off or or whatever. Anyway, they will come and look at it. Um, Roseanne. Um, the one thing everybody notices about hospitals, ever before we had the massive amount of immigration into this country, which has been a wonderful thing, mm -hmm. um, was the diversity 
of hospitals, particularly because of hospital staff, doctors from all sorts of different backgrounds, mm -hmm. nationalities, and, and whatever. Can we talk about eth ethnicity for a minute as a, a, a barrier to, to cultural engagement? I mean, is there something that hospitals could do to act as a sort of a, a template, perhaps, for uh, the, the use of the new ethnic diversity we have in this country to uh, en engage in terms of people's health and well-being, that there is a wealth within one hospital alone of tradition, of culture from all sorts of backgrounds, and then increasingly we're getting patients who will be coming from those sort of backgrounds. Are we making enough use of that particular that's, um, Absolutely, I mean, that's a great gift. point, actually, because yeah. this is an opportunity to, to use uh, creativity as a vehicle to capitalize on the richness of ethnic diversity that we now have in our hospital systems. We saw it very much actually during the recent um, national or international nurses day where, where, where nurses from all backgrounds were asked to share some cultural experience and you know Twitter was absolutely hopping um, uh, for the day but the experiences that we all shared from different ethnic groups was fantastic. And we, we've had um, also, uh, you know, foods. So you bring in obviously cooked foods or we'd have the fire engines rattling all the time up to the hospital. Cooked foods from different ethnic backgrounds. The point is that we're gregarious animals. We need each other, we need social engagement, we need laughter. And, and sometimes we can, particularly in an employment scenario, those from other, ethnicities might feel marginalized or not, not, not as connected as they should be. So using creativity as a pathway for connectivity across the diverse ethnic groups working within our system is hugely important. It'll bring much better quality of life to the workforce and you know if we get back to the tax payer and, and the department that'll mean more productivity. Uh, yeah, Eilish. Please, no, thank you so much. And it's, 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 a, it's a side part, but it's really important about, about where art can actually help. So um, when people talk to me, they all talk about the new children's hospital. But fundamentally, we're still three children's hospitals at Crumlin, Temple Street and Tala. Mm. And they have you know, hundreds of years of experience. But there are three different locations, three different origins, three different cultures. Mm. So we are using art um, to actually integrate the, the, the cultures of the organization to what's going to be our new organization. So art is a great leveler because people come sometimes thinking the Temple Street or the Crumlin or the, the Tala Hat. But once they're in a room with artists and we have choirs, you know, you know we also have a treasure chest which is, has been led whereby people in their organizations like say, I'm Eilish, I'm in Crumlin. So yeah. when, how are they going to connect with where they're going to the new hospital? So we're bringing the treasured art and having a project where we engage collectively across the three organizations to actually identify what matters to us in our history to bring it into the art. And the artists are leading on that. So it is whereby art as a leveler is actually integrating the cultures of the three hospitals into what is the future. I don't think any manager could do that. So it's a real yeah. example Michael, of, of, of good now work. That you've, now that you've got your mic back, um, th just on that question of, uh, of art as a way of joining up the people who are inclined to sit in their different silos, and gosh, do you get that in medicine? Yeah. yeah. 100% you do. Uh, in fact, it's full of, the health service is full of silos, and I think that connectivity, even just from a patient perspective, uh, independently of creativity, I think is, is, is lacking. And I think this, the connecting the network of networks I think is important. We heard that this morning. I think we have an opportunity. I thought the minister spoke fantastically well, actually, to be mm -hmm. honest, has given us a mandate. Mm -hmm. It really, really was fantastic and brilliant to hear. And I think we need to now connect up the dots and from the top downwards, but also build a movement. And I think there's a lot to be said about a movement that gets a lot of traction that we should pursue. Well, I'd like to thank our panel, but ask them to stay where they are for the moment, because we are now joined by the Minister for Health. But So, uh, if he's, he is indeed, would you welcome Stephen Donnelly.
Well, good morning, all. I'm delighted to be here. It's a, it's a, we deal with a, a lot of pressures and a lot of challenges in healthcare. Um, but isn't it wonderful to be here celebrating something new and progressive and creative and collaborative and fundamentally good, a collaboration between the arts and healthcare. I was at a concert in the Point Theatre, or the two or the three, the Point, uh, it would always be to me. It was a Fela concert. Um, my wife was terribly embarrassed uh, that I was at that age that I was uh, going to go to it, but I was at it last year. And it was the first live music uh, event I'd been to in a long time. And I was talking to Tom, Tom Dunn. He was comparing it and he was performing at it. I was talking to him backstage ahead of time. And he was talking about how important it was for the artists to be performing again. And uh, we sat through an amazing concert. But the, what was really evident from it was the raw emotion the raw emotion from the artists to be performing in a big venue to a, to a live crowd again, and the raw emotion from those of us sitting in the, in, the, in the audience. People had been through a brutal, brutal few years in the arts community, obviously, uh, but right across the country, and there was an outpouring of emotion uh, that was facilitated by music, by performance, um, by the arts. And we all know, you all know better than anybody, um, that the arts are food for the soul. But I think what we're discussing today is a relatively new idea, at least in the formal healthcare world, that the arts are not just food for the soul, but they're very much food for the body, food for the mind and can be uh, an incredibly powerful part of health and wellness and rehabilitation and prevention, physical health, mental health. Um, and it's only relatively recently that this has been discussed in a healthcare setting. Um, the WHO in 2019, it was about three years ago, they highlighted the benefits of the arts and creativity um, in prevention. Uh, ill health, but also promotion of good health, management and treatment of illnesses at all ages. So they were saying really, I think very importantly, the arts and creativity are not just some marginal thing that be, can be considered as a nice to have at the periphery of healthcare, but actually the arts and creativity need to be brought into healthcare uh, in a much more determined way, in a much more systematic way and they become a fundamental part of the delivery of healthcare. And I think that's very exciting. Um, it may have been discussed earlier, but the TILDA study on creative activity in the aging population, the Catherine Martin Fund at her department, um, found that being involved in, the creative, in creative activity is associated with better outcomes in psychological health, higher quality of life, lower levels of loneliness, lower levels of stress, lower levels of depression. And never has that been more important than now um, with everything the country has gone through. Um, and when I talk to particularly older groups who feel that they, you know, spent a lot of time on their own, they talk about loneliness, they talk a lot about depression, they talk about the, the physical, the mental, the spiritual, the emotional burden that COVID um, has come with for them. So never, I think, has it been more important or more timely that we would, be, uh, we would be moving in this way. Now, of course, the arts are already used in hospitals, and our healthcare uh, practitioners are very familiar with them. We're putting a big investment in women's healthcare. And one of the things we're doing is we're moving to much more uh, modern labor suites and labor wards, and we're, 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 we're upgrading and making things, making things better. And when you look at the modern labor suites, they're very different to the kind of sterile, white, clinical, highly lit room um, that uh, has been the case to date. The lighting is much softer. Um, there's music uh, in them, and there's visuals, which I think is really, really interesting. I was in Cavan General Hospital on Friday, and the midwives were showing me some of the changes that they've made, but they said, probably the single most impactful thing they've done 
is one of the walls in one of the labor suites is now this high definition photograph of an outdoor space, very calming, very soothing, it's a beautiful piece of photography, visual arts. And they said the impact that has had um, has been quite profound in terms of labor uh, and in terms of the stresses and the strains and everything associated, uh, everything associated with that. So we know it's already being deployed and no doubt Eilish has talked about how it's being deployed um, in children's hospitals, um, uh, with, the, with the, uh, the Hospice Foundations, with Laura Lynn. We know that, we know that arts um, have been used, but I, I think what's really exciting about today's symposium is we're marking a change. We're marking a change from this being a nice thing that is deployed in different ways to a much more strategic look at this and all of government approach to this. So I think it's, I think it's really important and it's very important from my perspective in terms of healthcare. Our goal is universal healthcare. Um, it's a very simple idea. It is a profoundly important goal. And I believe it's one of the most important unfinished projects of our republic. Universal healthcare is very simple. There's three tests. Um, does our healthcare service provide to patients, be it preventative medicine or be it responsive medicine, a healthcare system where you can get access when you need it, that it's consistently high quality, and that it's affordable. That's it. That's what universal healthcare uh, means. And in many areas, that has been achieved. But in far too many, as we know, it hasn't been achieved. Um, it is a very complex thing to try and solve, as Mike and Eilish and I and all the healthcare uh, professionals in the room know. But if we're going to do it, um, it's not enough to have great hospitals and great community care. That will never be enough. Um, we'll never be able to meet uh, the demand fully. What we have to have is we have to have um, the best possible prevention, the best possible wellness, uh, the best possible rehab. And I think that's really where the issues that you are discussing today are going to come to the fore. So, I think, the, I think what you're discussing today not only has great potential, but actually will, will form a really fundamental part of this bigger project in our republic, which is that every man, woman, and child can get the health care they need when they need it. And it cannot matter how much money you earn. More egregious still, it cannot matter how much money your mum or your dad earn. These things cannot matter in our republic. And ultimately, where I see what you are doing today, or how I see it, is being an instrumental part of this really important project for, um, for our country. You'll be aware of Healthy Ireland, and we have this framework now for improving health and well-being. And today's theme fits very well with that. We've invested a lot more money in Healthy Ireland. I doubled the funding to it and the budget for last year. We've added a lot more money again. Um, this year, and of course that funding is helping support some of the wonderful projects that are being discussed today. It allows and supports these stronger links between healthcare, between wellness, between creativity, um, between the arts, healthy communities, social prescribing, uh, which is something that is, that is uh, having a big effect, mental health promotion. And I think today really helps discuss that and expand that. Where do we go next? How can we be really ambitious for this? How can we be seen as one of the best countries, one of the leading countries in Europe, one of the leading countries in the world when it comes to advances and collaboration between the arts, wellness, um, healthcare? One of the fundamental principles of Healthy Ireland is that health is everybody's responsibility, which uh, I really like, that in order to achieve our goals, we have to have partnerships across society. It can't just be the HSE or uh, the Department of Health. And I think the recent memorandum of understanding between uh, my department, the HSC, the Arts Council, the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, Wealth, Sports and Media, um, it is a fantastic collaboration. I think it's a very important one. Um, and I was looking through some of the projects that are being showcased here today, four of them in particular. The Traveller Wellbeing Through Creativity Project is the first one. Um, I think this is wonderful. Uh, lots of different projects, dance, film, visual arts, crafts, photography, drama, 
celebrating traveller culture, celebrating travel, traveller identity. I think it's a wonderful and important piece of work. The Healing Arts Trust in Waterford. I think I'm in Waterford in about two weeks. It'd be lovely to, uh, lovely to see them. But bringing, uh, bringing arts, bringing arts experiences to the bedside, to the patient's bedside, what a wonderful endeavour, what an important endeavour, and what a difference it can make to patients, uh, it can make to their families. And I hope that the funding is allowing that work to expand and to grow and to come into more and more people's homes. Um, the Irish Hospice Foundation uh, is an extraordinary uh, organization and their member bodies, the hospices, the adult hospices, the Laura Lynn Foundation, they're just extraordinary, uh, extraordinary people. And I've seen some of the work that they've done, dealing with end of life, dealing with grief, um, dealing with everything that that encompasses. It's one of the most complex aspects of healthcare um, in the country, and I'm delighted to see that the Memorandum of Understanding is helping and supporting the Irish Hospice Foundation and deploying um, some of these tailored programs to our own people, to the HSE staff, but also to local, to local communities. And then last, but by no means least, Helium Arts, um, Ireland's children's art and health organisation. Um, they're supporting, as you all know, children facing lifelong medical conditions, very difficult medical conditions, um, and helping those children realise their creative potential. Um, I've seen some of this work, not necessarily with Helium Arts, but I've seen it in, uh, I've seen some of these things happen in Laura Lynn, and the transformation that comes over the children, the sense of pride, the sense of accomplishment, the sense of emotional connection, spiritual connection, given everything that they are dealing with and everything that their parents and their brothers and their sisters and their families are dealing with. It's, it really is, it's awe-inspiring to see um, these projects tap into um, the creative center for these children. It's wonderful to see and I'm just delighted uh, to see that it's being supported uh, as well and I hope it grows and I hope it reaches, gets the opportunity to reach out to so many more children uh, and their families. So it remains then for me to just uh, say a few thank yous because projects like this, events like today, um, and the work that you're all doing um, take a vast amount of organization, take a vast amount of dedication. So I'd like to thank Tanya Benotti, Eamon Kelly, Joan Maher, uh, Maureen e. Conigal at Creative Ireland, Anne O'Connor and her team at the Arts Council, Sarah McCormick, the Healthy Ireland lead uh, at the HSE, and Sarah's team, and in my own department, uh, Sheila Caulfield and uh, Tom James over here um, leading up on Healthy Ireland. Uh, and can I just say a thanks as well to all of you who are involved in these projects, um, because they require funding and they require support from the department, from the HSC, from the Arts Council, from all of these places, but ultimately, it comes down to individual workers, individual volunteers, individual healthcare providers, individual artists, um, engaging with patients, engaging with communities, engaging with children um, to create something really special, really important. So I'm, I'm really very excited about this work. It's pretty new. I spend quite a lot of time in hospitals and in community care settings and there's a big opportunity. There are parts of different hospitals, like in the maternity suites, or like in Laurel Inn, or like in Children's Health Ireland, where it's already happening. But I think there's, there's vast potential to move our thinking from responsive medicine to prevention, wellness, mental health, physical health, spiritual health, emotional health. Uh, and I believe the arts and creativity not only are important to that, but I would wonder how we could achieve full mental health, spiritual health, emotional health without the arts and without creativity. So thank you for everything that you have done and thank you for, in advance, for the wonderful and inspiring work that I have no doubt you're all going to do in the coming years and months. Gormagwif.
And thank you very much to Minister Donnelly for being here. He has a busy brief, as we all know. Um, we're going to take a short break now. Five minutes or so, note the or so is what they say. So we'd like you back in your seats at about 11.45 or so. Thank you. here in the Royal College of Physicians and indeed to our audience online as well. Our next discussion is going to be about the link between arts and creativity and community well-being and we're going to have a look now at a short video illustrating creativity at work in a community healthcare setting, making music in St Camillus Nursing Home in Limerick. Watch the faces. Oh, it's for to share and as I worked hard for the credit. And getting up late on Sundays, I Today we had one of our uh, regular two-week sessions uh, with uh, Musicians on Call, which is the group that come in and are working with our team to build on um, those therapeutic relationships that we have with our residents. We're evolving away from a medicalised model of care where we would have, you know, been very prescriptive about how we deliver care. It not only creates a feeling of well-being within our residents, but also within our team. We come in as the musician in the door and the intention is to offer a song which we hope will spark a memory. We love to be flexible with what we do, but also to hear their voices. We're there about supporting their songs and their music. We couldn't do it right that without the support of staff. It's like it's a friendship that develops. In some ways, it feels like an extended family. And already today, there's voices that might have been very quiet at the very start of this program a year ago. And already they're jumping in with songs and requests. The value to me of music in this setting is about being alive and in the moment with music in a space that we're all doing this together. And that's for, be it for the musician, the staff, the resident, the family member, it's a shared experience that we all get to talk about afterwards. It's not so much what you can measure as much as what you can feel. And I think um, if we talk about the arts, it's measured really through our senses. Sometimes when somebody's listening to music, their heartbeat can lower, you know, they can become so much more relaxed. Their breathing can become so much more relaxed. That's, to me, how the creative arts affect a person physiologically and psychologically, you know, and I think it's huge. Everybody seemed very happy. There was a smile in everybody's face. You know, people went in there, they were after getting up, and they were drowsy, and they went in and, you know, they weren't themselves, and suddenly, the smile came on their faces and they were all extremely happy. Anything that supports uh, people and supports their self-esteem and gives them confidence, brings joy and fun, socially gets people together, singing, chatting together and having fun, you can't beat it. We spend all day every day uh, going from one thing to another and I suppose uh, telling ourselves how busy we are as well. Um, and our, our residents, they see that. Um, and that opportunity for the residents to know that this is their time, we're there for their time, we're enjoying the relationship that we have with them through that as well. For me, parking, being the director of nursing, for a short period of time to become that, um, that person within this community at that level, it's invaluable. I thought the man who said <coughs> a smile on everybody's face after the singing session a sort of sum, sums, it all, sums it all up. Um, so just to introduce you to our panel, we're joined on stage here by Maureen Kennelly, Director of the Arts Council, by Justine Foster uh, of the Illin West Cork Arts Centre, lovely arts centre by the way, and by Yvonne O'Neill, National Director of the HSE. Maureen, You've done decades of work in this area of the art of managing the arts. Um, but 
what have you learned about the link between arts, creativity, and, and, and the sense of well-being in a community? Well, just listening to that uh, voice, the, the nurse on that video there talking about the heartbeat being lowered, um, just reminds me of the impact. I think the more that I have worked in the arts, the more obvious to me is the positive impact that the arts have on people. And more and more, I think it's about empathy. It's about how the arts open us up to each other. Um, and when you and I were discussing today beforehand, I was talking about storytelling and um, how, how much story and language is so important to us. And that's not just in terms of literature, which I suppose is the art form that I, I probably have uh, most recently been associated with, but storytelling across all art forms, and I mentioned to you the very sad news, unfortunately, that the brilliant guitarist, Dennis Cattle, who many people will know, uh, played with Martin Hayes and died, unfortunately, after a short battle with dementia on Monday night. Mm. And I remember back in Kilkenny, when I used to run the Arts Festival there, back in the 90s, and Martin and Dennis came to play with us. And like lots of arts managers here, I was doing up the blurb, and you know, you're using these lovely hyperbolic statements about oh, weaving the magical spell and I remember distinctly writing that about Martin and Dennis and saying they weave a magical spell and one month later, seeing them, they literally took the roof off St. Canice's Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's transcendence, that's the arts. That was just the most remarkable manifestation of it because they're absolutely communicating with us in a way that they're opening our hearts completely and they're revealing us to ourselves. So. It's, it's that very, very strong thing of communication. But um, going back to the heartbeat, there's a beautiful piece. I'm, I'm sure like lots of people in the room here, like a magpie, you collect things and you think, oh God, that's yeah. just so apt, that's fantastic. Yeah. So there's a piece here that I have cherished for a long time and I'm sure lots of people in the room love the American short story writer, Raymond Carver. So it's a short piece from an introduction to his collection of stories where I'm calling from, which seems to me just to really sum up um, what the arts do. So Carver writes, if we're lucky, writer and reader alike, we'll finish the last line or two of a short story and then just sit for a minute quietly. Ideally, we'll ponder what we've just written or read. Maybe our hearts or our intellects will have been moved off the peg just a little from where they were before. Our body temperature will have gone up or down by a degree. <clears throat> then, Breathing evenly and steadily once more, we'll collect ourselves, writers and readers alike, get up, created of warm blood and nerves, as a Chekhov character puts it, and go on to the next thing, life, always life. So it just seems to me to sum up the, and that, that <coughs> idea, it's lovely what Eilish was talking about earlier, about the, the stilling that the arts can do, the idea that it can be so powerful that it can per perform almost as an anaesthetic for a child. I mean, that's just mm -hmm. phenomenal. It reminded me too of Anne Enright as this amazing book, Making Babies, about, about her time giving birth to her first child. And she talked about her, the very difficult first birth and seeing her husband, Martin, in the in the um, uh, <coughs> delivery room, in the labor ward, and the stillness that was in him that powerfully affected her and helped her th through labor, yeah. so. Yeah. No, I, I'm just remembering Dennis Cahill, I mean, how could one not today? And he and Martin were regulars at the final concert in St. Canice's, and I was always a regular sitting there in the audience. And we'd come out after those concerts, because it was the end of the festival usually, on a high, yeah. you know, thousands of happy people. And you just said to yourself, this has to be good. Yeah. This yeah. has to be good. Justine, you are both an artist and an arts manager down in, in, in the lovely uh, arts centre in, in Skibbereen. In terms of what you have seen about what art and creativity can do in terms of a community's well-being, what, what would you have noticed? Well, it, it creates a space for imagination. It creates, um, I, th I think, um, what, is it, what is important in the connection between an art centre and the healthcare um, is, is in that we work together and we work as equal partners in order to, for, for the well-being of people in healthcare. And that um, 
in our, in our particular program, we've been going for about 20 years now, and it was initiated by Champions, a, a, a health promotion, a really um, proactive health promotion worker came knocking on our doors, saying, oh, I, I see you've done some work in healthcare before. Um, we've got this aging with confidence strategy. We've got some money for a pilot project, and we'd love to try something out in a community hospital. And so it was both the champion and the policy that came together and a little bit of experience that brought our program off the ground. And 20 years later, we're there. Uh, but what we have is we have this little local infrastructure that is built on place, that is built with the, with the champions, but also with a level of expertise. Uh, and that because it's been going 20 years, we're not so much um, champion-based, but role-based. And we're trying to keep that going, that build that infrastructure, so that we've got. We've also got the department. We've got the adult education, the um, local authority, and the two different departments within the HSC, and ourselves. And each of us lend uh, a different thing to the program. And I think it was at its height that this um, partnership, this way of working together really showed itself during the pandemic when we were, all, we were all suddenly shifted and older people were isolated at home. Between us, between the organizations, within our community, within our place, our network was there. We were able to reach out within weeks. We were connecting to people. As the daycare centers closed down, the staff were redeployed to frontline and we were posting out art projects and our artists were phoning older people at home and um, immediately uh, uh, creativity was ignited straight, uh, because of this infrastructure and because of the trust that we had built up with our HSC partners Indeed. that we could do this. Um, I, yeah. was, I was about to say West Cork is a different country. They do things differently <laughs> there. But in fact, you know, we've seen examples. I mean, for instance, just taking up what you said there, there was always a lace-making tradition in Morris, County Carlow, where I'm from. Yeah. And during, the, um, during COVID, uh, they got together to post out kits to various uh, groups there. And I happened to be at their exhibition eventually when they, when they mounted it. And they had done wonderful stuff. Yeah. And the pride on people's faces in terms, this, I made this. And sometimes it would be people whose grandmother maybe had, had been one of the last lace makers. Uh, but even for those who didn't, they, uh, they had done just absolutely lovely, lovely stuff. Yvonne, somebody said to me just going out at the break, um, when are we going to hear from the artists? So here you are, you're on a panel where we have Maureen who speaks for the arts, we have Justine who is an artist herself and speaks for the West Cork uh, Illin Arts Centre. But can I put it to you, this business we were talking about earlier um, of artists and the health service, finding the language to be able to talk to one another. Is, is that something that you've talked about, thought about? Uh, so look, I think the question about when we're going to hear from the artists would have been why I'd happily step down and invite anybody to come up actually, <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't rather than being here because I feel like that we have yeah. an expression amongst us, uh, our colleagues about, you know, I'm here completely uninhibited by any lack of knowledge. Um, so, <laughs> can, so, so can I just say that this is not my subject matter expertise. However, I am thrilled to be part of this and, and actually just to acknowledge your starting point around Dennis Cahill and remembering Dennis and the work he's done more recently with the gloaming and himself and Thomas Bartlett with Martin Hayes and, and others. But one of the, th there was a lovely interview where he and Thomas talked about working on, with the Irish tradition music and he said, we don't have to um, um, move or knock the pillars, but we can do a lot within them. So if I could just use that analogy maybe in answering your question, which is actually, the earlier point about wanting and the minister's point uh, earlier about you know this being an opportunity for health and for health to offer a different experience then i think that's where we begin to make the connection and the point that's been made by a few people this morning around creativity being the opportunity to tell stories <coughs> And Mike mentioned earlier around how in the earlier part of his career it was about the interventions and the technologies and now it's about actually the hearing from people. So 
our health and in community. So I'll always get the opportunity, of course, because we're in direct competition with our acute colleagues around how important we are. And uh, so, uh, yeah, exactly. And so, look, in, in community services, we're talking about, you know, 60,000 staff and seven billion of investment. And in, there, in across the whole of the HSC and our partner organizations, there's four and a half thousand buildings that we deliver services in, in about two and a half thousand uh, locations. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I just want to say 50 of them are acute hospitals. So the rest of it is the range of services that are provided by um, 60,000 staff to a range of service users that is so broad and coming with such a scale of need and such a variation in need. So, so what I hear in an experience and I'm aware of in my completely uninhibited lab, uh, by my lack of knowledge around that connection between arts and how we deliver services is staff saying that they got the opportunity where there was that connection to hear and listen to a story differently. So we have, and, and, and um, uh, Eilish very el eloquently talked about, you know, how the children should be the, um, the, the driver of the environment and, and influence that. And equally, we across that commu our community services, we're dealing with a huge range of people who are very vulnerable and often actually finding it very difficult to communicate in words as well. And so um, we have had the opportunity to use other types of creative ways of hearing from our users. So, like, if I took an example of, like, we have 1.6 million people who will receive a therapy across our community services in primary care. So that's not including even those um, thousands that receive them in our residential settings for disability for older persons, just crossing the, uh, the threshold of the 300 buildings um, in primary care. So, and when they're meeting those people, and in fact, you know, a number of those, quite a high number of those could actually be meeting people in their own home. So the opportunity for different ways of engaging and the creative arts and where we've been able to utilize the types of programs that have been talked about here, that's actually given our staff another mechanism by which they can engage. And actually, I think, and I think COVID, I mean, the examples are, are strong, um, COVID stripped away a lot of the sort of the, um, the I suppose the, dem the demands and the stresses as well for staff and our service users about how we connect with each other. And that creativity, the innovation that was in the creativity actually was just demonstrated in a way the wealth that's in our staff as well as um, uh, by actually the formal bringing in of people who professional, professionally have uh, uh, been able to add to that sort of um, connection on, uh, within the arts. So, I mean, with 60,000 people employed in community, I guarantee a very high portion of them are very creative people. And in fact, uh, a lot of them are yeah, artists themselves. You, you you yeah. paint an interesting picture, Yvonne, because we just come from a discussion where we were talking about hospitals. Yes. So the, the hospital, the shape of the hospital, mm. the building mm. um, was a, a sort of a world mm. unto itself mm. in which room mm. had to be made for patients mm. and their lives and their, 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 their wishes outside, of course, their medical care. Yeah. Um, whereas what you're talking about is a much more equal balance, yes. isn't it, yeah. between the delivery yeah. of the service and the person receiving it, because yeah. you're in the community, you're in their world. Yeah. So yeah. in a way, maybe they can communicate more easily with yeah. you and, and, and tell you what, what, what you want, what they want. Yeah. yeah, and I think that there's a variation in that. I think for, if you think about the thousands of people who receive services from our public health nursing, so they're stepping into their home, and I think there's probably an opportunity there for probably that more, um, uh, uh, that type of dialogue. Um, but even I thought the point that was being made in the video there was powerful, where the director of nursing said, it's the moment when I don't have to be a director of nursing yeah. that I step you in. Step out of the uniform. And exactly, step out of the uniform uniform yeah. and 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 we have done and again there are people in in this audience or tuned in to us uh, today who could speak so well and with such um lived experience and knowledge of this but just limited things that i'd be aware of for example in our mental health services the use of drama 
is, uh, you know, is absolutely um, phenomenal, actually, to allow um, our live service users with lived exper um, experience and their family, actually, members as well. And we talked about it earlier around how, for those that are socially excluded groups, that uh, um, arts is something that within our own daily lives or whatever it is, may be more accessible to, to those, but for socially excluded and vulnerable groups, less so. So the use of drama, actually, one of the things that struck me, it can close out a loop as well because some of those users participated within the setting that they were in, like a mental health service, but in fact it became part of what they did outside as well, so they reached um, out in their community to engage because they'd had the experience when they were in our services. So it does give us an opportunity to close out the loop as well. Justine, can I just come back to you, since the, the voice of the artist maybe is the one we now need to hear a bit more from. Um, I mean, I think it's lovely to hear about a link between the world of the arts and, uh, and health. One of the things it might do is put a little bit of money an artist's way, give a little bit of work outside what they usually do. So tell me from the point of view of the artist how that engagement works. And I mean, it wouldn't work for every artist. No, it's um, it's a very uh, it, it, there's a very very particular set of skills that would be required, and um, you know whereas somebody might be interested in drama, somebody else might be interested in film, somebody else might be interested in mu music, and so on our particular program we try to have a broader range of artists with a with a high level of skills, a composer, uh, and um, and they would have to have a very high level of confidence in their own practice. And so there are, there are a number of supports. How would a composer work? Well, a composer, we, we would work more readily with a composer than a musician because it's about the creation of work. Um, as opposed, I mean, there is space for performance, and performance is wonderful, but we work a lot with community. So, it, so the conversation, it, a, lot, a lot of artists talk about the conversation. And the conversation is where the ideas and the, and the, and the concepts are created and where new work is, is made. And, um, and that, is, that is so important even to the very last day of our lives. And so, so that's the crime, type of environment that the artists try to create. And the pro and programs that, 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 have, that last for long, you know, that don't begin and end, that don't have funding for only eight weeks, that have funding and supports as well. So it's not just about money, it's about residents, it's about spaces for artists to uh, develop their practice and to enhance their practice, to work with each other. So when you have a musician and a filmmaker and a poet working in a healthcare setting or in a community health setting, you, 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 know, you can have tenfold. The, and, and with the arts managers, there's a lot of arts and health managers here, they, they build that um, space in order to make it work for the participants the, the, and the artists. So when this word social prescribing is used uh, about uh, getting people to get involved in, in, in things outside themselves, maybe creative things and whatever, is the structure there? Well, social prescribing is, is a really great initiative, but I think it's just maybe one or two percent of the whole picture, mm. you know, because um, uh, and, and there does, no, it's not. There is more work to be done in terms of the receiving organizations mm -hmm. and the training of artists to, in order to accommodate people who might have extra needs. And, um, so, so there's a whole body of work that needs to be done around that. You can't but, uh, just walk in off the street and do it. No, but yeah. uh, in one sense, we have been doing community referral for years. Yeah. So like we, we, we as an arts venue, we would have a long-term partnership with the Family Resource Center who might identify young people who have needs who would then get a free place at our youth theatre. And those kind of, those kind of um, informal yeah. um, social prescribing has been happening for years. Um, so I think it's a great thing, it's a great initiative, but it is only a small part of, of, of what arts and health is. Mm. And um, uh, the, I suppose at the moment a lot of work happens in acute hospitals and in residential care because of previous policies. But I, I can see that the working community is, is certainly going to be and what a bigger sort, part. What sort of artists, what sort of creative people work best in terms of 
giving that link between uh, creativity and well-being. Yeah, I think it is artists with a, a really strong uh, practice because they have to go into a non-art space who don't yeah. know their work. That's where arts managers come in to help them create that link. Yeah. But they also have to have a very, um, they have to be responsive and they have to be responsive to the people that they're working with. They have to take on a higher level of admin. It, uh, they ha uh, in our in our, our program. State admin. No, uh, well, some are really good at it actually, <laughs> surprisingly. But again, it's about learning. It's about models of practice. It's about passing on that learning. Yeah. It's about building in um, uh, de workplace development learning, peer learning, so that artists can artists that we've trained maybe with yeah. putting health workers and artists in the same room to learn from each other, yeah. which, uh, uh, you know, uh, help join the dots up, help, uh, help navigate our sector languages. So that's literally how you create a language that both sides will understand. You, yeah. you get them to work together. And it hadn't struck me, of course, any artist who's going to work with a group needs to know that group's expectations, what needs they might have, needs to have a little bit of training about presenting a case. Yeah, so yeah. we have really practical tools. An artist walked into a healthcare setting, they, they have a checklist, and immediately the staff has to tell them who's well, who's not, who's fall, who might fall, who might, who, oh, yeah. who's passed away. Yes. And, and, and unlike any other practice, uh, uh, participatory practice, someone in your, in, in your group may have passed away that week. So Maureen, so. as, as um, director of the Arts Council, grand little job you do on the side, you know, at the weekends and when you've got a bit of time in the evening, um, what do you need to do in terms of the arts community to make them aware not only of the opportunities but of the sort of training that they might need to do that work with people uh, to increase well-being? Well, I think it's by continuing to support the likes of Illen and Waterford Healing Arts and Helium and Sing Ireland, I know Dermot's here, and a number of other organisations who are doing fantastic work in this area. Uh, work, I mean, I'm slightly kind of stepping aside from your, your question at the moment. At the end of Mr. Donnelly's address, I turned around to Yvonne and to my colleague Anne and said, I feel like we're living in a different country. I feel extremely optimistic coming out of today because listening to Minister Martin and Minister Donnelly, you know, there's serious thinking around this area now. There's, they, I think they get it, and I think they know what we need to do uh, in terms of communicating at the highest level between arts and health. And you talked with Tanya and others earlier about education. It took an awful long time for us to get to a reasonably good place with education. We're certainly not there yet, but we've made enormous strides, and the Arts and Education Charter was formulation 2013 and now we have creative schools which we roll out and we work very closely with Tanya, Creative Ireland and Department of Education but that has taken enormous amounts of work and that is about a shared understanding of where we want to get to and I would feel very very hopeful coming out of today that arts and health sectors you know are, can get to that place and of course it needs investment so it will need more investment and it will need um, a signalling of that investment fr from, from both sides. From our own part, the Arts Council is absolutely committed to continuing our work in, in this project in, in Renew. Um, but um, going back to maybe something you said earlier, it's, it's about to resourcing artists so that, and re resourcing the arts and health coordinators who do brilliant work, and some of them are here I know, so that they can, can work with artists. And artists by and large are brilliant communicators and they're enormous wells of empathy. So I think they're ideally placed to do this sort of work and they've shown it through, through the difference through education. Um, so really it is, it's by working with the other sector and by, by communicating the benefits. But what about, I mean, I'm looking, for instance, at the sort of people who like nothing better than to be left alone for a week, two weeks, three weeks, because they're wrestling with a poem or they're finding a difficult chapter to get through in, in a novel and whatever. I mean, are there certain artists who are better suited to that sort of work than others? Yes, no, absolutely. And art but forms that are better suited. Yeah, absolutely, I would think so. Yeah. I would say there's not a better art form. I'd say there's any art form, but I, I would, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 go 
um, a bit, but artists uh, that have a, a compassion and a, and a high drive, uh, mm. it is a very challenging workplace environment to, work, to be in. Yeah. So. Yeah. But the good thing is we have no shortage of artists, excellent artists in yeah. Ireland, Olivia, so there will always be a cohort for whom this will be an excellent um, way to work. And it's a very important point you made as well, that it's a very... Um, important form of income for some artists so you know we need to, to ensure that that's kept up. Yvonne, something artists will often say is you know we put an enormous amount of work into just learning how we could do a, a, a particular piece of artistic yeah. work with the community and we did it for 12 weeks or whatever mm. and by the end people were really engaged mm. and they really wanted to move on mm. and then the next thing the funding is pulled mm. and mm. the artist feels betrayed, the people feel yeah. betrayed. Um, isn't, isn't that a difficulty that sometimes yeah. um, there'll be pilot schemes or somebody yeah. will be given a go for 12 mm. weeks at something, but there's no follow up? Yeah. So it's, and I think it's a really important part and I mean again it uh, wouldn't be my area of expertise but I think things like the artists in residence type schemes gave a little bit more of that continuity in other sectors as well and it's something that for um, health I think we have to think about about it actually being a core part of a service offering and actually then it gives a continuity for the three participants, the artist, the, um, the staff, and the service user. So they're all getting used to that again as a language and a construct and a way of engaging. And actually more importantly and um, equally important is we can't keep doing what we're doing. So health can, it has a, a level of need it cannot meet with the resources that are available to it. And I was interested when Eilish was saying earlier, if she came into um, uh, uh, my equivalent on the acute side saying I want money for um, nurses, for play therapists and for art therapists. She said, you know what I get. But in fact, I nearly think we're at a point that we might have to challenge that and say, we yeah. can't get nurses. We yes. actually can't employ nurses. There just aren't point. enough. Yeah. And actually the really important thing is maybe the play therapist, maybe the artist, actually as a core part of a valued team construct, actually allows the nurse work at the scope of their practice and an artist can add to that. And equally, maybe when the artist has artist block, mm -hmm. in fact, maybe not been in the room poring over the book, maybe actually being a core part of the team could actually be the enabler. So it's an actually win-win. So yeah. I think, and, I, and I'm, I'm like, I am very interested in how... But that's, in a, our, re that's a really important it point. Is. I mean, is, is that something you're actively Absolutely. pursuing? Well, well, we, but, we can yeah. get nurses. Yes. Here's an opportunity. Absolutely. Maybe there yeah. are alternative and paths that could deliver yeah. almost as and well. The, and and the, we talked a bit this morning around evidence base. And you see, I think that's what helps us as well with our our respective funders and our respective stakeholders or whatever around how funds are offered to us on a recurring basis <coughs> rather than a once-off because the once-off is the killer um, piece that you're getting at. But actually I think when you bring when the evidence base around how the professionals have come together and the therapists have combined, so be it a speech and language therapist working with somebody and maybe an artist can engage with that service user in a way that the speech <coughs> and language therapist can't, but the professional speech and language therapy piece can be a huge um, complementary piece. So I think we can if we start bringing, um, and it's, I don't think there's a, in a, a, a sequential nature to that, it's a parallel, we don't need the evidence to do it, we need to do it to give the evidence. Yes. So I think it's about a commitment to sort of beginning to think, <coughs> again, the pillars are we have to deliver a service, it has to be safe, and you asked that point around earlier about how we make sure in social prescribing that we know we can stand over, that the um, service user is safe, that it's a quality service. Um, and Mike talked about the percentage of doing damage, etc. So actually, we just need to make sure that the pillars are around safe and effective and good outcomes. But within the pillars, we can mess around, you know. M Maureen, just looking at one or two groups who traditionally don't engage, um, um, very often uh, the sort of arts... Um, endeavors or groups uh, that are there, very often men don't engage. Now, how, how do we get around that? 
Well, it's funny because Anne and I were just reflecting in the break about the whole area of equity and the landscape of a hospital or community care setting where, you know, we have, artists have the opportunity to communicate with a far wider cohort of the population. And I think you referred to earlier, you know, there's a traditional understanding that the arts is um, enjoyed by primarily in the main well-educated middle-class white audience. So that the whole area of health allows us this opportunity to really collapse all those distinctions, to really yes. penetrate you know, with, with great effect, and something that Yvonne said earlier about just society being being paired back through COVID. There was just this this feeling of everything being collapsed and exposed, and of course the, the common enemy of the pandemic. And in 2020, we spent a lot of time in the Arts Council on Zoom calls with Stephen Donnelly and Tony Holohan and Ronan Glynn talking about the guidelines and how how the arts was going to to make it through, and that has helped, I think, enormously, not that one would wish a pandemic in order for us to arrive at this understanding, but that has helped enormously in terms of us understanding each other. And, you know, and obviously, health, the, the health sector was just complete hero in, in the time of COVID. So for us all to, I think, a reach a better place of understanding, that, that has certainly helped. How do we engage men? Men famously don't get well, involved it, in community uh, arts. Uh, somebody mentioned men's sheds earlier, and it's funny, yes. you, you and I separately in preparing for today, I was talking about a, an article in The Guardian from a couple of weeks back where it cited that women read books equally by men and women, whereas men, I think the statistic was something like 80 or 90 percent are by men. Yeah. Um, so we, we work in different settings, um, we communicate more clearly, we, we invest more in, in programs that will, will attract men. How have you found that as practically on the ground, engaging men in the community? Well, I think um, we have a high level, of, we have a high number of men engaging in the arts program actually, I think, yeah. Uh, I think mainly it's about approach, um, it's a person-centred approach. So, uh, and we would have a diverse artist team. So, you know, if somebody might um, see themselves reflected in the artist team, you know, in their own background culture or their own gender or identity, and, and that might help. But also, it's about choice, isn't it? So, so um, if um, I, was present I was in the hospital at end of life and I was presented with a drama project, I, I'd, I'd be under the duvet, you know, but if... <laughs> And given, given, given some drawing materials, I'd be in my element. So, um, I think, I think uh, it's the same uh, with every. You know, we're just looking to give as much choice as possible. One other group, and here, one would actually see the potential of uh, the involvement of arts and creativity in, in health and well-being. Say, with the travelling community who have their own culture and um, particularly in areas like, like singing and, and folklore. Um, have, have we done enough in that area? Is there potential there? We certainly haven't done enough. We're, we're only at the start, I would think. Um, I was saying hello to, to John Connors and Owen de Bordeaux are here, and John Connors myself. Uh, John was MC of an event in Darndale the other night, which was, there's a brand new festival called Made in Darndale, which is a program from Creative Places, which is a program that we run whereby we're investing, we're kind of hot housing a number of places around Ireland. So Darndale's one, uh, West Cork Islands is another, and there are very, various others. Uh, Bagnallstown, another one. Yes. But, um, and that, that was a terrific brand new festival, very much by and from and of the community. Um, so it's, it's just one example. We're certainly not doing enough, but it's by working on the ground that, and investing in a very, very real and sensitive and, and constructive way that we'll make those changes. Yvonne, in a funny way, the pandemic allowed us all maybe to stop and think about, about some things. It, it was a hard time. 
Um, but it did allow us to sit back and, and look at things. And I thought something you mentioned earlier was really interesting, um, that in the middle of all the, 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 the worry about not being able to engage more, more mm. nurses, um, that one should look also at the mm. other opportunities, yeah. that nothing will ever replace a good nurse. I'm no. not suggesting that. Um, but it, it does yeah. open the possibility of other, other, yeah. other approaches. Mm. Um, and the possibility of the arts reaching communities that yeah. might be yeah. difficult or might be suspicious, yes. might be defensive, yeah. Um, is, yeah. is, is that another thing we should, yeah. we should take on board? The, I think for the sure. The doors that the arts can open. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think, in fact, it was like the, the piece around the, you know, sort of the experience in COVID just demonstrated the network that's on the ground in the community, actually. So, I mean, HSC is a, you know, a construct that can only deliver because of the partners that we have throughout our sort of voluntary providers into the community sector and on the ground. And there was hugely innovative, creative models around how to reach vulnerable populations, homeless populations, and uh, you know, travelers, our um, Roma community, in the way in which we tried to work with them during, co during COVID. And in a way, that, that optimism that was you were referencing as well earlier around, um, you know, there's great possibility still in that sort of there's still the wave is still there although time it is tough and we're trying we're in health we're looking back at the uh, fact that we have unmet need you know because of covid and but there's also still that sense of there's enormous possibility because we demonstrated something in covid that we need to continue to tap into there was an agility and innovation and i actually think one of the huge potentials around how in direct answer to your question olivia is i think the peer network is really important as well in the arts. So in the you know the the demonstration project outside you know with for in for traveller health, it's actually how the peer network then allows that to cascade. And I think that's going to be like very significant in in the arts. Yeah, yeah. and that's something the arts yeah. does for us. Really. That it allows yeah. us to sometimes think the the unthinkable. Exactly. Well, we've had three hard-working panels, uh, I think, this morning, and I think we're going to give them a rest and bring, bring our, our morning to a close. And maybe I just wanted to say that um, it can take a lifetime to learn that making something, and that can be a poem or a quilt or a piece of music or a chair or a play or a dance, making something creative makes you richer and it makes you richer than all the money in the world. And it doesn't just enrich you, it enriches all the people around you because you've made something rather than acquiring something. And you've put your own print on it. And in the doing of it and in the losing of yourself in the doing of it, you've learned something new about what it is, just for a moment, to be able to stop time, something more about what it is to be alive. That brings our symposium to a close. Just as I say, thank you to all our speakers and panelists. Um, you're invited to remain for lunch, which will be served in the room that you just passed through on the way in. So to our audience here and our audience online, thank you and have a great day. <laughs>